Hey, um, as I welcome Ralph back up, I wanted to highlight one of his books that we don't have on our book table. It's called Let Go of the Ring. And he's in that book, that was one of the ones I read uh, of his last year. And in that book, he's actually telling in way more detail uh, some of the stories that he told last night and talking about how uh, we actually like pass on the discipleship, how we actually pass on leadership and discipleship stuff. And so I forgot to highlight that last night. Uh, I think that one's only available on Amazon. And um, you can check it out. It's really good. So, Ralph, we're so excited to have you uh, back with us today. I turned it on on my end. Do I use this one? There we go. That's good, huh? Um, get a pencil out. I want to tell you some stuff that you ought to write down. And um, it's actually a commercial. If you are thinking about planting churches, and, and, and here's really where the gold is. I know there's some of you guys that are thinking about becoming church planters. And, man, thank God for you. I am a part of an organization called Exponential. I actually retired from pastoring about two years ago, and I'm on staff with Exponential. I write a, usually a book a year from them, and I do some speaking and whatever. But Exponential got started 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, by a, a guy who's a nuclear engineer. Uh, that means he was designing nuclear submarines. At age 29, he had 6,500 engineers working for him. Very smart guy. And he left it. Because we're losing the church in America. We're losing the culture in America. We're losing the church in America. In the 40 years that we've seen the rise of the mega church in the United States, we've also seen the curve go down in terms very slowly at the beginning, but recently it's gone a lot faster. Christianity is shrinking in America. And uh, Exponential was started with a goal to the, the, that they had found out that only 4% of churches in the United States had ever reproduced a church. That means if you're sitting here and you're thinking about you'd like to start a church, you're a part of a church that hopefully would launch you and give you some money, give you some people, and certainly give you some encouragement and, and some time. And only 4%, including church splits, which probably account for 2%, you know, half the 4%. And... Um, so the goal was to move the needle in my friend Todd's lifetime from 4% to 10%. Well, actually, in 10 years, they've moved the needle to 7%. 7% of churches in the United States have now multiplied themselves in another church. I think that is amazing because it's almost doubling what was going on. But here's what we know. We know that sociologists tell us that if you can get 16% of, a, of any population doing something. And the whole population begins to look at that, and that becomes the normative behavior. Not the normal behavior, because not everybody's doing it, but the normative behavior. Everybody wants to do it. So what we've had in the church for the last four decades, normative behaviors, I want to be Bill Hybels and Rick Warren. What we're beginning to see, the thing is tipping over to where we're starting to think about the, the last seven-eighths of the book of Acts about sending people out and multiplying the church and making disciples the way Jesus made disciples because that's what Paul did is he did what Jesus did. And so uh, Exponential has, has done a really good job of that. They've produced over 100 now, probably about 115 free books, let alone videos and what other stuff. It's not a denomination. It doesn't want to compete with anybody. It, it wants to come along like Stadia and just come alongside of you. And so write this down, www.exponential.org. Exponential.org. And write this down, Mega Multi Multiply by Ralph Moore. It's a free book. It's on there, an e-book. There's over 100 e-books for free on Exponential. I've written three of them, I think. And this book, it talks about that the mega church has not done the job that we all thought it was going to do. And then everybody went to multi-site, but that's beginning to be tapped out. Mega churches that started multi-sites are now beginning to divest themselves of the sites because they don't want the overhead. They don't want to have to manage the thing. 
And as they do, they're trying to turn their sites into churches and with mixed success. Some are doing well, some are not doing so well. Mega, multi, multiply. It should be mega, multi, micro, because that's what it really talks about. So here's the thing. We're in a political climate where half the country blames the evangelicals for Donald Trump and half the country hates Donald Trump. So they're looking at us in ways that they didn't look at us five, six years ago. It's not healthy. Millennials come up glued to their phones, but craving relationship. They show up in a church and it's got a fancy light show and smoke and all this stuff and everything's programmed down to the second and they're put off by it. They say so. Gen Z is put off by it. They're looking for authenticity. They're looking for relationships. They're looking for dialogue. They want to argue about faith. They need a friend to walk them into Jesus and they need a friendship to nurture them. And we believe the next step is what we're calling micro church. And the idea is this, that you raise up a disciple, what I'm going to talk about today, you raise up a disciple to the point that he's capable of pastoring somebody else. He keeps his job or she keeps her job or her career. So the church isn't saddled with a big financial overhead. And then they start in a house or they start in a coffee shop. And, they be, and, and, and we're actually seeing guys now planting churches from pure evangelism. I hang out in the coffee shop. And to, you know, one of the things I've done is I've gone to a, a gay coffee shop. Didn't work, by the way. But I, I, I went into a gay coffee shop with a book called God and the Gay Christian. And the reason I chose that book, I've never even read it, is the, the font on the cover is about that big. And, and so I went in the coffee shop, plopped it on the thing and, uh, in, the, in the Hillcrest neighborhood of San Diego and sat there waiting for somebody to pick a fight because that's the person of peace. That's the guy I want to get to know. Uh, I found that person, actually a gay person, in a different way. And, and we spent, my wife and I spent two and a half years working on this guy. And we got him to the point where we can't meet together, but what he wants to hold hands and pray. But he still wants to argue about everything. But, but, but you know what? That's discipling somebody. That's what Dan Boyd did to my brother-in-law. Am I making sense? And so we believe the future is in, in planting microchurches. And get this, every church starts as a microchurch unless it comes out of a big church and, and, and launches with 150 people. I have a friend, and the book starts with this story. I have a friend in Sri Lanka uh, who it has planted, the last time I talked to him, had planted five microchurches. He was supposed to pick me up to go to the airport, and he was late, and there's a civil war going on, and it's scary. There's machine guns everywhere. And I'm in the hotel, which they stuck me in. I'd been with a family, but then they put me in a hotel because I was leaving in the middle of the night. And, and I'm freaking out because the guy didn't show up. And finally, he shows up to give me the ride to the airport. And he's, and he's got this incredible BMW. And I'm a car nut. And so I go, tell me about your car. And he goes, I want to tell you about my church. And so he tells me, I, I pastor two churches, one on Sunday afternoon about 4 o'clock and one Sunday night at 7.30, and tonight my 7.30 church is my last night there. And they had a party for me, and that's why I'm late. And the good news is I'm starting my fifth church next week. And he's just all excited. He goes, I attend the big church on Sunday morning. At that time, the big church was 350 people. Now it's about 2,000 people. And he goes, my family's there. My kids are there. It's stable. It's all that. But then I, I go into neighborhoods where I wouldn't take my children because it's dangerous. And I plant churches. And, and I'm getting ready to do my fifth church. Is that cool or what? So then I go, well, tell me about the car. And he goes, oh, it's a company car. I don't even own it. And I go, well, what kind of company gives you a car like this to drive? And he goes, oh, I, I own the BMW distributorship for the country. <laughs> this guy is filthy, stinking rich. And he's out planting churches in the ghetto. And there's a trail there that if you follow it, anybody in your church that's capable of leading a home Bible study, if you tweak their thinking and their paradigm a little bit, would be capable of reaching out to somebody who didn't know Jesus and starting there. And, starting, and, and it really means that we really take a different think of what we're going to call a church and what we're not going to call a church. But anyhow, that book is there, and it's... Uh, it's, you know, we, the, the church in Sri Lanka is now a couple thousand people, and they've started 
like 2,100 of these churches. And some of them number 800 or 1,000 people. And they started out with a, with a handful of people in a home. And so we're teaching people how to start churches with no money. And, uh, and pretty much anybody can do it. While I'm making commercials, write this down, uh, www.ralphmore.net. And that'll take you to a blog that I do pretty much on a weekly basis and a podcast that I do pretty much on a weekly basis. This week, it's Robert Logan, kind of the church planting guru. I interviewed him, but mostly it's stuff I teach and kind of stuff that you're going to hear here. And so anyhow, that's that. Well, let's get into the teaching. And uh, we're calling this Disciples Making Disciples, the Key to Multiplication. And if you can give me the first slide up there, we'll jump right into it. Um, my story in a nutshell. I, I, uh, go ahead and give me the second slide. We're, we're, we're a little confusion about our slides. Give me the next one. Just keep going until that whole thing comes up. That will be good. Okay. So I told you my story last night, how we got to planting churches uh, almost by accident. My friend, Rich Agazzino, who kissed me on the neck, um, we became a pretty good friend. We began to hang out together. Uh, we got him to, to lead a church on Sunday night, basically. They be, decided they wanted to become their own church. Uh, we struggled through with our denomination, and all of a sudden, we're off to the races planting churches. We had a guy named Al Eastland in our church. He was just a natural... Um, gifted evangelist. He's a salesman today. He makes a lot of money in sales. Uh, this is a long time ago. This is like 1972, 73, 74 in there. And, and um, uh, Dave never went to college. He, he got a job in sales right out of high school and started making money hand over fist and, and didn't need to go to college. And, but all his friends, he played on this, the, the Culver City High School volleyball team. And his buddies pretty much became the Santa Monica City College volleyball team. And he wanted to evangelize his friends. And so he took a couple classes at Santa Monica City College just so he could play volleyball, just so he could evangelize his friends. He's Jewish. He ends up with this Bible study on Friday night in the home. You've all seen it on TV, perhaps. The home that O.J. Simpson lived in uh, in the time of the infamous act. And uh, at that time, the Eastland family owned it. And Al Eastland got saved through Dave. And Al Eastland's mom was the president of University Synagogue at UCLA. And pretty soon we have a Bible study meeting on Friday nights. It's got 40, 50 kids coming to it. <clears throat> and this Jewish lady who's the president of a synagogue is teaching everybody to sing Hebrew songs. And it's just going gunzo. And Dave comes to me and says, I can't do this. And I go, you can do this. And he goes, no, I can't do this. I'm an evangelist. I'm not a pastor. It's become a church. You got to do something. <laughs> and so we're sitting around. We had uh, a little tiny church building. We had bought a house that was actually just a kind of a studio on top of a double garage for Sunday school. And we were in the process of remodeling it. And we're sitting in that room when Dave's giving me the bad news. And a guy named Gary Sonardi comes walking by. And Sonardi had just graduated from a Bible college like a week before. And he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. He's thinking about maybe going to Germany and, and starting a, a little microchurch. And, you know, we're just trying to figure out what, where he's going. And, and so I see him. Dave's telling me the problem. And I look at Gary and I go, there's the solution. And so Gary comes in the room and I go, hey, Gary, say yes. And he goes, what do you mean? And I go, just say yes. And, and he goes, no, yes to what? I go, say yes. And, and we argue for a little bit. And I finally go, look, do you trust me? Yeah, I guess I do. Am I your pastor? Yeah. Am I your friend? Yeah. Say yes. All right. Yes. What did I say yes to? You just became the pastor of Hope Chapel in, in Bel Air, California. And uh, it, was, it was that nutty. It was that opportunistic. And then and, and the denomination had a church building that was empty uh, in Culver City, kind of where all these guys mostly lived. And so we ended up in that building. And and one thing led to another, and we, while we were still in this denomination, uh, for there was a period of about five years, every time they had a failed church in the South Bay area of Los Angeles, an empty church or a near empty church, whatever, they'd call us up and go, do you have anybody that could be the pastor? And we, didn't, we weren't training pastors at that time. We were making disciples who could make disciples. And by the way, that's the key to everything. 
who are making disciples, who know how to make disciples. Because if you do that, you probably already are a pastor. And so we would just kind of look around and go, yeah, you could, you know, and, and we were just putting people together. It was, it, I believe it was directed by the Holy Spirit. But I would not say it was spirit-led in a traditional sense of the thing that we're seeking the Lord and we're looking. They're calling up. They got a problem. We're going, who's ready? And, and we're just putting people together. And you know what? God was blessing it. God was blessing it. Our feeble efforts are what he wants to bless, no matter how feeble and no matter how kind of stupid they are sometimes. And, and so we've grown uh, to, like I said last night, more than 2,300 churches, actually more than 2,400 churches. But it's, it's not been a, a, a well-structured program. It's been fits and starts. It's just been things that, 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 that popped, and when there's an opportunity, we went for it. In 1978, I was on an airplane on my way to Hawaii. I love the place. It's beautiful. The people are beautiful. Uh, I have just spent uh, a week with 1,200 Japanese-American people. They all happen to have black hair. And um, I'm on this airplane going to, to Hawaii on my vacation. I'm walking down the aisle to go to the bathroom. And I see a vision, like, boom. It's, it's just, it happens, it's set fast. And what I see is myself, full size, in an area about twice the size of this room, but the area is Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, shrunk down to about this size. But I and about 40 people, all with black hair, are standing up on the side of the mountain like we're looking over the city, like we're surveying the thing. And I'm seeing it from the vantage point of I'm in the air above Kaneohe Bay. I'm aware of being there. And I'm looking down on myself on the mountainside with those people. And two thoughts come flashing to my mind. I believe this is a word from the Lord. One is five years, and the other is the word dominant. And the next thought was, this is God telling me that I'm going to move there in five years. We're going to become a, not the, but a dominant spiritual force in the community. And the next thought after that was, Ralph, you're being stupid. You like Hawaii because it's beautiful. You're making this up. Knock it off. And I did. And 19 days later, I came home from my vacation. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm wasted because we took the red eye. We wanted to get the last few minutes out of the beach. And so we actually went to the airport in the morning, left our bags there, took the city bus back into town, dumped our rental car took the city bus back into town, took the bus late at night back to the airport, flew all night to get home, and some guy's working a jackhammer in my neighborhood, and I can't sleep. And at 8 o'clock that night, I get up to preach in church because we're doing church Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning, Sunday night in those days. And, uh, and so I, I just go to the office to open my mail. I'm all grumpy. About 3.30 in the afternoon, I'm going home, and Dick Whittett comes up the steps. We, we had bought a bowling alley for church, and it was upstairs. And so I'm walking down the steps. He's coming up the steps. And he goes, hey, Ralph, anything unusual happened to you on your trip? And I'm going, no. And I'm pretty grumpy. And, and he goes, well, remember I told you before I was, I was praying for you every day on your trip. And he had. He told me before I went on vacation, God told me to pray for you every day on your vacation. And, uh, and I go, that's really cool. Thank you. And he, and he goes, yeah, but you should be praying for me because I'm the one moving to Montana to plant a church, not you. And so I remembered that day. So now, you know, days later, he comes up and he, and he goes, anything in you should happen? I go, no. And, and he goes, well, I was certain that while I was praying for you, the Lord told me that on your vacation, you're going to be caught up in the air and given a vision of your future. And so, in godly kindness, I go, so what time you got? And he goes, oh, about 3.30. And I go, yeah, me too. He goes, why? And I go, well, because my vacation gets over about 8 o'clock when I stand up there tonight in church. So if God wants to do what you just said, he better hurry up. And I went home. And about two hours later, I'm eating dinner, and the peas fell off the fork. I mean, it's like, oh, my gosh. I was in the air on the way to the bathroom. <laughs> I was in the air in the vision, and he just described that to me. I've got to take this seriously. And so I did. And I was, I was in a graduate school at the time, so I, I, for a, a master's thesis, I wrote a history of Christianity among Japanese Americans in Hawaii. We got ourselves all set up, and, 
and, and, and moved to Hawaii. And nobody would rent us a, a space. We thought we had rented a building. Uh, on the way there, we found out that they weren't going to rent to us. It was illegal. We started a church in a park, and it's against the law. You cannot get a permit, so we faked it to look like um, to look like a picnic. That guy Don McGregor I told you about from the Philippines, he showed up the night before we started church on a Saturday night. He shows up, calls me, says I'm in town. Can we get together? I go. We're starting church tomorrow. So he comes to my house that night and coaches us on how to how to run a con game, and it proved that we needed it because the cops were there. And, uh, and, and so, you know, we went on from there. But I want to I tell you kind of what ha happened to us and how we have built what we call a disciple-making continuum that has put out all these pastors for all these years. And I think this is something that's practical. I hope you guys have some questions about it later on because it's so simple. Somebody said one of the problems with things that are so simple is you can't monetize them, so uh, there's no way of, of, of selling the thing. Uh, but, but if I can give it away, I sure would like to. So if you can give me the next slide, I would appreciate it. I call this the keys to our multiplication. Uh, go ahead, just give me the next one. Um, there, we, we, we have found an easily reproducible, easily scalable model. If you can't reproduce it, I'm not sure it's worth doing. This is the argument that I have with the megachurch. It's really hard for those guys to multiply churches because that, see, I think that perfection is not excellence. They think that perfection is excellence. And there's a problem there because if, if you demand perfection out of everybody, you, you, then perfection is not easily reproducible. Um, the, the second key that I think is there is a continuing example. What I'm going to talk to you about today, I do. I'm right in the midst right now. I'm a, I'm a church member. I'm not a pastor any longer. But uh, my wife and I are in the third week of what we call mini church in our church. And as a pastor of a church of you know 3,000 members, I always led a mini church. I don't think that I even know how to disciple guys to lead a mini church if I'm not leading a mini church. And everybody on my staff had to lead a mini church. And we're all training guys how to do it over and over and over again. So I think another key to our multiplication is that there was a continuing example that whatever I'm asking people to do, I'm doing all the time. And then the last thing that, in terms of my input, has been that uh, I'm always championing vision and results and and uh, I write books, I write emails, I'm always talking about stuff in church. One of the things that I discovered early on, I, I was influenced real strongly by Chuck Smith and, and oddly across town from Chuck Smith and, 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 and there was animosity between them actually, but Robert Schuler, the Crystal Cathedral guy, when I was like 25 years old, he took me under his wing and he coached me a lot and I got some really good stuff out of him and you know, later on, um, I, I connected with him again, and by that time his doctrine had deteriorated. I, he spent 45 minutes telling me why hell didn't exist, and uh, so we're not really on the same play page. But there are some things that, that Schuler taught me, and one was the, the, the power of the pulpit, that, that if you want more of something, brag on it. One of the things that I, I found really incredibly uh, potential in church is, is you catch somebody doing something right, and then you get up and tell their story. And you tell their story over and over and over again. And pretty soon somebody else will do the same thing because they like the attention the other guy got. Now that's a pretty carnal thing. But I'm here to tell you, it, it, it works wonders. When Michael Chung was 15 years old without asking permission, I pastored three churches in my life. I pastored in Hope Chapel, uh, Manhattan Beach, which turned into Hope Hermosa. I pastored Hope Chapel, Kaneohe Bay in, in Hawaii, which is now... Uh, Anchor Church, Hawaii. My son actually pastors it now. And I pastored Hope Chapel, Honolulu, which was in the movie theater in Kahala Mall, if you know Hawaii. And we rented five theaters on a Sunday morning for like $125,000 a year. We got five theaters for five hours. And we're only using three of the theaters. Michael Chung is a kid in the church. He's 15 years old. And without asking permission, which I think is wonderful, he starts a junior high school group in one of the movie theaters. He became our youth pastor. And so I get up and start talking story about Mike 
and just bragging on Mike every opportunity I got. It fanned his fire. Next thing you know, he's discipled two people who are seven years older than him, a married couple, to take over the junior high group because his junior highs went into high school. Pretty soon we got in a little church, like a couple hundred people, we got 22 kids in our high school group, plus about eight or nine in the junior high school group. Michael's done this. But as I just keep bragging on Michael, other people start things. A couple guys went out in the street and began to pastor people living on the streets, homeless people living on the streets. And when the police did a sweep and, and took everybody's tents out and everything and they moved, it took three weeks for those guys to find their church. But they found where the church had moved because homeless people tend to move together and then they were able to follow their church to where it went. Some people got a ministry going in Kenya. They started eight churches in Kenya uh, just out of what I'm going to teach you today because we had brought it into the lives of our church to the point that they could reproduce it in Kenya. And so um, some pretty simple keys. Have a, a model that's easy to reproduce. Uh, set an example yourself and, and then champion the people who are doing well at it. Brag on them. You know, whenever a mini church would multiply and start another mini church or a mini church pastor gets ready to go start another church outside of our church, we talk about it all the time. Yeah, whatever gets talked about, gets done, gets reproduced. Is that good? Okay, let's go to the next slide. And go ahead and give me, get it down to where I got all, all of them. We, okay, here we go. So we're, um, we're going to talk about something that I call a disciple-making continuum. And I, I want you to think about this. I'm going to have some cute little chart things up there. The big red dot is me, and the little green squares are you, okay? So this is just church on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon or Friday night or Saturday night or whenever you have church. And, and, and the anchor to everything that we've done is what I learned from Chuck Smith two weeks before I became a pastor. Teach the Bible verse by verse. Just take people through the scripture, make it fun, make it interesting. I grew up in church. I actually grew up in a, in a mega church at a time when there were few of them in America. I was in a denomination of small churches, but I was in the biggest church in Oregon as a kid in Portland growing up. And I, I love church. I love the Lord. I love my pastor. I'd go to school and try to tell friends about what Jesus was doing in my life. And I'd inevitably try to tell them about the sermon from yesterday. And then I'd remember that I could only remember two of the three points and I wouldn't say anything. I sat in a Bible college class uh, where we went through the prison epistles, the epistles of Paul from when he's in jail, and, 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 and the, the guy made it fun, and he made it interesting. I'd sat in a class in Romans, and the guy made it heady and, and heavy and intellectual, and, and, you know, I was a kid, I was pretty good in math, and, and so doctrine and linking things together really inflates my head. I'm really good at that. I like to do that. I like to show people how smart I am. But I sat in this class in prison epistles, and, and this guy, Clarence Hall, made it fun to know the Bible. And he, and, and, he, and he didn't get all theological, and there wasn't a whole lot of Greek in there. It just, he just brought it down to where you could get it. And I, and, I, and I marked my life, and then I hear Chuck talk about, well, all I do is cut down the program of the church and just take people chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I'm going, I can do that. And so this became the anchor for everything that we do in our church in this model that I'm here to teach you. If you give me the next slide, uh, you will see that here's you guys. You're the little squares again, but now we're broken up into groups. And little yellow triangles are people that I'm discipling. In a small church, they probably would be my staff. So let's just think of this as a church of about 25 people. And so I got three people that I'm closely discipling as my staff, and I'll get into what I do with those people in just a little bit. But everybody is, is in, a, in a small group meeting together. And how different is this from anything that you've ever heard before? Not at all. Everybody does this. There's just a little twist on the way we do it. And one of the twists is this, that when we get together in these groups, we don't go, what does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? We say, what did the Holy, and you could write this down, what did the Holy Spirit say to you while the pastor was talking? One of the things I like about being with vineyard people is that you 
still believe that the Spirit speaks. And you believe that, he, that he's readily available to speak. I've built my whole life on this. What did the Holy Spirit say to you while I was talking last night? Would be a good question to ask. So I don't think that the Holy Spirit only speaks through me when I'm up there. I'm a pretty good Bible teacher. I'm a pretty good storyteller. My wife, I'm Irish. My wife says I have the gift of Blarney. But I think it's the Holy Spirit that gets the job done. And so I know that there's times that I'm standing at the back door of church slapping hands with people and high-fiving little boys, and people come out the door and say, Pastor, thank you for what you said today. It was so beneficial. And they tell me everything that I said, and I never said it at all. Because <laughs> the Holy Spirit was talking to them while I'm up there running off at the mouth. And so it's much more important what did the Holy Spirit say than what did Ralph say. But we've got to have a basis for stuff. We've got to have a place to start with. We've got to have a basic knowledge of the Scripture. That's my job. The Holy Spirit's job is to change lives. So we ask these three questions. We get together and we ask these three questions. What did the Holy Spirit say to you while the pastor was talking? The second question is, what are you going to do about it? Now all of a sudden, there's accountability. See, first you've put your life on the line talking about you and the Spirit. So now there's accountability. Well, this is what I'm going to do because next week they're inv invariably going to ask you, how's it going? And then the third question begins to bring the body into ministry, the body of Christ. And that question is, how can we help you? How can we walk with you? How can we pray with you? Where do we fit into your life? And so, you know, we call this a disciple-making continuum. It's a continuum from the Word as it's preached, as the Holy Spirit applies it into the life that we live, and we live it together. There's a continuum in that I'm discipling the little yellow triangles. See, I'm the little red thing in the middle. I'm discipling the little, little yellow triangle guys. They're discipling the members of the church. And so there's this, there's this continuum that I think has to start with the lead pastor. Next slide. And so... We're, we're, we're laying a foundation that's, that's more teaching than it is preaching. Um, we're discipling members around the sermon, and we're discipling leaders around the books that we read together. And so now, again, the triangles and the circle. I'm the red circle again. I'm pastoring a church of 25, 30 people. I've got six people that I'm discipling as leaders who each are leading one of what we call mini churches. Am I making headway with this? And so what are we doing as a, in, in terms of leadership development and training? Well, reading books together. Well, what books do you read? Well, whatever books that the pastor thinks are appropriate for the life of the congregation at this particular time, or whatever books does the pastor think these guys need to get the job done in their life. Do, do you see there's a distinction? Sometimes I'm having those guys read books because I want to infiltrate the congregation with these ideas. Other times, I'm having them read books because they need basic stuff because some of them are going to go out and plant churches. So what do we do in our meetings, our training meetings? Well, we've all read a chapter of the book or two chapters or whatever it was that we agreed to read, and we come together and we ask three questions. What did the Holy Spirit say to you while you're reading the book? What are you going to do about it? And how can we come alongside you and help you? Do you see how simple this thing is? When I was pastoring Hope Chapel, Kanye Bay, we are buying about 180 books at a time. I had that many people because in a bigger church, you have a hierarchy. I'm discipling the staff. They're discipling. You know, they're discipling. And so it goes down. When you're able to get a church of a couple thousand people and almost 10% of the church are reading the same book at the same time, you're influencing that church in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. But what we're doing is we're harvesting people out of this thing because some of these guys that you see the little yellow triangles are going to end up having something in their heart that says that they could go out and they could plant a church. And this is where we're getting all the, all the pastors from, this very, very, very simple thing that we're doing. Now, it does get more complicated because things just get complicated. I just don't have time to give you all the details. But this is, this is the bones of it. 
if you read Let Go of the Ring, uh, you're going to see how we developed this thing and, and, and why we developed it and, and the, the failure that led to the success that we've come to know. Go ahead to the next slide. At this point, the little yellow triangle it has been one of those disciples, but he's felt that God's called him to go out and plant a church. And so what we're asking him to do, usually it works this way. Usually it works that uh, you've got, you've, you've planted three mini churches in our church. You, you've started, you, you came, maybe it just works this way. Somebody led you to the Lord. They brought you into our church. They brought you into a mini church. Somebody began to see leadership ability in you. And inside that mini church, that group of 12 people or less, they, they raised you up and said, you could lead this thing. I'm going to go out and start another one. And then eight months later, you've raised up a disciple and you've gone out and started another one. And then you did it again. And by the time you do it three times, I'm knocking on your door saying, you know, you look an awful lot like a pastor or a church planter to me. Would you consider doing this? And you pray about it and you decide you're going to go. And, and so, again, now we've got the, 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 the members of the mini church. And what we ask them to do is gather as many of your people that you already have been influencing around you as you can Take them with you out the door and start the church. And, and, and then we have certain parameters. If you can't get X number of people to go five miles across the town, then we're not going to probably send you out because we don't really see you as a leader. If you can't get at least seven people to move to another continent with you, then we're not going to probably send you out because we're not going to see you as a leader. So there's standards that are involved in the way. I'm just trying to give you the, the general thing. But at this point, I, as the lead pastor... I'm going to spend a lot of time with you on, on a weekly basis. I'm going to spend an hour and a half, two hours. And, and the shape that that's going to take is mostly just, uh, what do you want to talk about? You know, we instruct guys, if you're going to plant a church, you, you just get a blank notebook. And every element in the church, you write a piece, you, you, you note a piece of paper is about that. And then you try to write a theology for every element in the church that you're going to create. And then as you're developing that theology, then you and I'll talk. And I'm going to mentor you, and I'm going to take you through this thing. So that's it. That has produced 2,400 churches. That has produced in, in New Hampshire and Massachusetts a chain that goes from California. In 1982, we commissioned Jeff Fisher, who was 20 years old, surfer, lived in the San Fernando Valley. We're at the beach. He goes surfing all day Sunday and then comes to our church on Sunday night. That's how we met him. He was already a Christian. He's, he loves the church. Sunday night's rock and roll, good time, uh, heavy into the word. And it's pretty soon he starts bringing friends. And pretty soon they start bringing friends. And pretty soon they run out of cars and Jeff's banging on me. We need to start a church in Sherman Oaks where I live. What, what are you going to do? And I go, no, no, it's not what I'm going to do. It's what are you going to do? We need you to start the church. You're the leader. I'm 20 years old. Yeah, but you're the pastor. And so Jeff started a church. We sent Dale Yancey with him. How many of you are old enough to remember the Hollywood Free Paper? Anybody in this room? The Jesus Movement? Well, the, the one-way sign? Dale Yancey is the artist. came up with the one-way deal, the Hollywood Free Paper. Um, my roots go deep. Do you, do, you, do you guys know the name Ken Gullickson? Do you know that Ken Gullickson started a little microchurch in a, in, a, in a house that Matt Swaggerty was house-sitting in Bel Air, California, and Matt Swaggerty was a member of Hope Chapel Manhattan Beach at the time? And that's where the vineyard movement got started. We have commonality in our roots. But I've been around a long, long time, old guy. We send Dale Yancey, who's our youth pastor, and we pay him to be the babysitter of Jeff Fisher who's planting the church at, with no income. Jeff, all these years later, is still pastoring that church, and they've planted churches all over the San Fernando Valley, and I think they're planting in Fiji or someplace that's still going on. But Jeff eventually sent Dale to New Hampshire. Dale planted a church that failed. But along the way, he led Tom Johnston to the Lord, and Tom went out and planted 16 churches from a town, a village of 6,000 people in New Hampshire. 
One of the guys he led to the Lord is a guy named Joe Mabe. And then Tom sent Joe out to plant a church. And, and Joe, today the little church in a little tiny town, I've been there, owns a Christian TV station, the only one in New England. But then Joe led a guy named Rob to the Lord, or somebody in the church did. And then they sent Rob out to plant the church. And, and on, on one of my trips to New England, I met two more guys whose names I don't even know that came in succession out of Rob and then out of the other guy, out of the other guy, it turns out that thing goes nine generations deep. This simple little thing has produced that kind of results. But here's some things that we learn along the way. We learn that you're not a leader if you don't have a follower. It doesn't matter what kind of a degree you have after your name or what kind of experience that you have. If we don't see somebody following you around, then we don't think that you're a leader. If we do see somebody following you around, we pay a lot of attention to you because there's potential in you. Now, what that's done for us is, is it's caused us to interrupt the credentialing process. The credentialing process that would cause somebody to come to Hawaii, because this has happened four times to me, and go, I, you know, I, I, I'm so thrilled with what you guys do. I'd really like to come and, and plant a Hope Chapel. Can I get involved? Can, will you help me? And I go, yeah, for sure. Just what I need to do. Well, just move here and get a job and then get into one of our mini churches. And if the person in the mini church begins to see leadership potential in you, they're going to hand off the mini church to you. And they're going to go out and do another one. And then at that point, we're going to watch you. And if you can do it two or three times, then we're, we're off to the races. We're, we're happy to work with you. Yeah, but I graduated from a seminary. And I go, yeah, but that guy's a plumber. And, he, and he's been planting churches and he's getting ready to go, am I supposed to put you in front of him in the line because you went to seminary and he's a plumber? He paid his dues. And so we're, we think the key to our success is the way that we look at leadership, that, we're, that, we're, that we're, we're looking at it through more New Testament eyes. Paul says to Timothy, the things that I've taught you, teach to faithful men who are able to teach others also. There's four generations there. And so We've somehow interrupted that by sending people off to an institution that's supposed to prepare them for something that only the local church can prepare them for. We look at 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And Paul says when you get together, everybody has a song, has a hymn, has a tongue, has an interpretation of a tongue, has a teaching, has a prophecy. See, we want those things to be involved. And, and they're not going to be so heavily involved in them big meeting like this, but when you get 5 to 11, 12, 13 people in a home, then everybody has a chance to share, and spiritual gifts have a chance to come to the fore. And we think that's one of the things that has benefited us greatly. We look at Romans in, in, the, uh, in the 15th chapter. I think it's the 16th verse where Paul is writing a letter to people that he's never met. Because you read chapter 1 of Romans, you realize Paul hasn't been there yet. He apologizes for that in chapter 1. And, 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 and in chapter 15, he says, I'm convinced, dear brothers, that you yourselves are full of all goodness, that you have all knowledge, and that you're able to teach. And you know, that verse used to come, confound me. It's like, what do you mean they, they have the, all knowledge? How does he know that they're able to teach? He's never met them. Well, because they have the Holy Spirit. Because how are you full of goodness if it's not for the Holy Spirit? Because our righteousness is as filthy rags. At least mine is. And so he says that you have all goodness. He has to be going, this is a work of regeneration. This is a work of redemption. This is a work of the Spirit that I could even call you good. And when I say that you have all knowledge, well, we have all knowledge of what? Well, all knowledge of God. I carry it around on my phone these days. All knowledge of God in his word, the Bible. That's what I need is the word of God. And then apt to teach, able to teach. Well, all of us are teachers. If you're a mom, you teach somebody. If you learn how to invest in stocks, some, you're going to tell somebody about what you did, learned how to do. If you're a carpenter, you teach somebody. We all can teach. And so we've just taken a few of these things and tried to figure out how can we build this into the life of a congregation to where the congregation 
is a disciple-making continuum. See, I think that the Gospels and the book of Acts are a disciple-making continuum. I think that Jesus comes along and he teaches, he calls us, and he shows us how to make disciples. Then you get into the book of Acts, and my personal opinion is good and wonderful things happened on the day of Pentecost and in those few years after. But when I get to Acts chapter 8, I find it's nine years, nine years after the resurrection. And Saul of Tarsus rises up and persecutes the church. And the Bible says an incredible thing, incredibly wonderful and incredibly horrible at the same time. It says, all except the apostles fled Jerusalem because of the persecution of Paul. And everywhere they went, they went declaring Jesus. Everywhere they went, they went doing the thing that got them in trouble. But it says, all except the apostles. All except the guys who stood on the mountain and were told, I have all authority, you go therefore. And nine years ago, they went nowhere. Nine years go by. And then the persecution comes and it gets so hot that everybody leaves town except the apostles. The word means sent out ones. The sent out ones stayed behind. They were courageous in the face of persecution, but I think they're courageously disobedient. And then Saul of Tarsus gets knocked on his butt and you know God does things in his life and, and now he becomes the voice, the face of Christianity. That's incredible. It's an incredible thing. But what's he do? Well, what he does is he makes disciples. Paul and Silas. Paul and Timothy. Paul and, Paul and, Paul and. And so I see this disciple-making continuum. Jesus teaches it. He exemplifies it. He moves it. Paul picks it up. He does it. And it's handed down to us. And then somewhere along the line, the church gets all goofed up. And it gets all caught up in orthodoxy. And it gets caught up in buildings. It gets caught up in programs. Now it gets caught up in, in, in fancy production. And we've lost something. And so what we've done is we've tried to just go back and go, you know, in, 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 in the world that we happen to live in, how do you take what we see in the New Testament and, and make it doable in a local church? And if it wouldn't be doable in a church of 18 people, then we're not sure we want to do it in a church of 1,800 it's got to be reproducible to us. And pretty much that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So thank you. God bless.